Hello everyone, my name is Teresa Holmesy and you're listening to the special Earth Week podcast series where we talk sustainability. I'm joined here today by Jay Khan to discuss economic sustainability. Jay, how's it going? Going pretty good, Teresa. All right. Well, with that, um, I'm just going to get right into our first question. So um, if you could introduce yourself, kind of who you are and what you do. Okay. My name is Jay Khan. I'm Director of Facility Operations over at Central Michigan University. See the action C? All right. So that makes me official. And <laughs> and uh, uh, I do maintenance and custodial work. It's a big, long title, but maintenance and custodial work, you know, take care of the place from day to day. And part of that taking care of the place from day to day is make sure that the waste gets removed from campus in a environmentally responsible way as much as we can in the times that we live in. You're often recognized as kind of like the sustainability man at CMU. So how does your role connect to sustainability? So um, my training background is kind of engineering and architecture. So numbers do not scare me and we count everything. And that's what you do when you're in facilities. You count, 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 figure out how to improve your numbers, develop goals, benchmarks, KPIs, all kinds of crazy things that you never thought about. So um, as an example, the university has what's called a, a, a municipal solid waste picture. You can look at that picture like a pie chart. And the pie is 2,500 tons per year. And that pie chart is made up of stuff that goes to landfill, stuff that we send to the composter, metals that we sell, paper that we bale and sell, unused items that end up being sold or used items that end up being sold is a better better way of putting it like you know old computers old furniture stuff like that that you know we don't want that going to landfill and, and it's still worth a nickel or two so we sell it and um, um, we have an auction every month pre-covid um, last Friday of every month down at the sale barn and we sell a whole bunch of stuff so you add all that up, it's about 2,500 tons of stuff that comes off this campus every year. Now, 1,000 tons of that is diverted from a landfill, sold, properly disposed of outside a landfill, like composting, those types of things. And, and uh, um, so that, that equals about a 40% diversion rate, which it's pretty good. In Michigan, the average diversion rate from landfill for waste is 18%. And that's up from 15%. Michigan is the, the worst diversion rate in the Great Lakes states. And we, we um, uh, sell our landfill space to Canada. So, you know, room for improvement, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I guess given that introduction, um, what does sustainability mean to you? Sustainability means to me that if I have a choice between spending a dollar in an economically uh, sustainable way versus spent wasting a dollar in a landfill, then you know, if, 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 it's, if a dollar is a dollar, you know, why not do the, th the best thing for future generations in your current situation and, and, do, uh, and do something that uh, um, is better for the environment? As an example, um, for every ton that this university sticks in the Harrison landfill, which is the gas recovery landfill, by the way. So as landfill is going, it's, it's, it's pretty pretty environmentally responsible landfill because it's not bleeding off methane gas and killing the atmosphere like a lot of landfills. 
and they make money at it. So, you know, hey, hats off to them. <laughs> and that's uh, a, uh, a business partner of ours, Waste Management. They're also our hauler. We've had, done business with them for years and, and we like the way they do business. So, you know, that that's a choice. Um, so for every ton that we stick into the Harrison landfill responsibly, um, cost us about $90. And for every ton of organics that we do not stick in the Harrison landfill and we, we compost by having um, our own people haul that organic waste over to Morgan's compost farms up in Sears, which you've seen, that costs us about $42. And over the course of the year, that saves us about $15,000. It's not a tremendous amount of money, but you know, it, it's an economic decision, right? Even if it was even up, I'd still want to do the right thing and put it in a compost pile, a responsible compost pile, not an illegal landfill. And, uh, and, and that's what we do. So, you know, we look for opportunities out of that 2,500 tons that come off the campus every year. And, you know, they're small opportunities and we take advantage of the small ones, just like we take advantage of the big ones and try to do the right thing with, uh, with our waste. Speaking more generally, um, I mean, so far out of all the guests I've had, you, you're definitely coming from the most operational background, and I, I, it is part of your title, so that helps, um, but very technical and operational here. So do you think that there is always a better way to do something? Um, in, in the environmental realm, I, I would say this, is that it's tricky. And tricky for a lot of reasons. A lot of them have nothing to do with economics, have to do with political will and culture, as an example. So um, yourself, and I know you've done personal waste audits because I've seen the videos. Um, you are making choices. And you're not making choices based on really economics. You're make, making choices based on your value system. And so when you're, when you're doing your waste audit and you're going, geez, I could have done that different. Or, wow, I, I could have done that different. I could have, you know, that was a Coke can or whatever that I recycled and I was pretty happy about that. But those eggshells were a lot tougher to do something about. And so I threw them out. Plus, I didn't want the cat to get you know, so, so it's not always an economic choice. And a lot of it is personal. But I can tell you by looking through the trash, which is part of my job, that probably about half of it doesn't need to be there. And you and I have done waste audits before, and I have shown you that half. Now, if you want to talk about government regulation, now, in Michigan, there is a very, very small recycling economy, circular economy, as, as, as it were. And circular meaning, hey, look, uh, here, was a, here was something that we grew, and it came back around, and now it's compost and went back in the soil. That's, that's kind of a real easy way of looking at it. Some of the things that we also do, which are, are not so easy to look at, is uh, like a trash can bags, right? So we collect stretch film, which comes from palletized items in our warehouse. And we collect that and we sell it back to the trash bag manufacturer for seven cents a pound. And they make trash bags out of it that we buy. Petoskey Plastics, good business partner of ours. They actually, they do business with University of Colorado, which has a lot more stretch film than we do. And, um, but they, you know, we're not the only person who does that is what I'm getting at. Anyway, that's circular economy. Now in Michigan, getting back to regulation is that we have a very, very low tipping fee in this state. 
so low, in fact, that we are importers of trash. And the surrounding states have much higher tipping fees. So they are exporters of trash to us. Now, that kind of turns things on its head because those are commodities that we're sticking in a landfill and not really taking advantage of that other states are. And that's why they have better diversion rates than we do. Um, as an example, um, like electronics recycling, as an example. So that that you would you would hope would be recycled responsibly, and and usually I think it is in this state. But you you know there's there starts to be an economy with that, and the state whipped on some regulations that said, hey, look, that stuff's not supposed to be in landfill, and you have to divert it. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a whole bunch of um, uh, circuit boards from a telephone switch that was ancient that could fill up five offices being replaced by a computer that would fill up your desk. So that's a lot of circuit boards, right? So we collected all those and we packaged them up and we sent them away to to a responsible electronics recycler who we got third party certs that they were disposed of properly and they paid us for them. I think it was like 10 cents a pound or something like that. But anyway, um, that is an instance where government regulation did the right thing and said, thou shalt not dispose of um, electronic waste irresponsibly. And so it created a business, right? probably one of the, the few areas of regulation I personally agree with, but uh, that's for another podcast. <laughs> I agree with that one. Um, I guess we've already been talking around it, but I, for our listeners, um, I obviously invited you to represent sort of economic um, sustainability. And so uh, to just kind of name it, in your own words, could you explain what economic sustainability is and how it's a little bit different than what we just generally perceive as sustainability. Well, you might have to help me out with this one, Teresa, because mm -hmm. I think economic sustainability is just as it says, economic. Now, economic meaning not producing, only producing the amount needed to accomplish the goal. That's, at, and not more than what you need. That is an economy of scale. And I, I believe that that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, a lot of that's been going on for a long time, really. I mean, if you think of manufacturing, because manufacturing, you know, all the, all the little pieces that get cut from, oh, let's just say our, uh, printing press or something like that or some type of food line and it goes back into making the same product that came off the line right now that that's um, that's pre-consumer right we didn't sell something and then hope to get it back and make it again so pre-consumer has been around for as long as manufacturing has been around frankly um, but post consumer is a little tougher because you have to you have a, you have a, you have people making choices about what to do with the end product. So in that the the economy of sustainability, I think it starts to become a value driven question at that point. Once it it leaves it leaves the the grips of capitalism and becomes a part of the cultural experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, Is yeah. That, you following me on that one, or am I just? No, no, know? I understood that because um, I'm listening to you here, and you know, we're talking about kind of um, making them. You know, you, you started off by saying, you know, you have a dollar and you can choose how you want to spend it. Um, so for me, I'm definitely, and you, you brought this up earlier as well with the waste audit as to 
the reason why we make our decisions is sometimes on a personal value basis. That's kind of my connection to sustainability is just, it's not so much to me doing whatever's financially the smartest thing, it's doing whatever is gonna have um, the best impact on the environment or our society as a whole long-term. In my environmental classes, what I've noticed that sometimes sustainability is pretty contrary to whatever's the financially, you know, maybe short-term. Um, Long term is a different conversation, but how do you how do you consult how do you reconcile those two perspectives? I don't know. If, do you agree that there can be a disconnect? Starting there, I think that people are much more conscious about the manufacturing process, the way that people live is has become a science home economics. So I think that there is a great deal of hope that as society, we just get better and better about dealing with these types of questions. I mean, all I have to do is just drive down 127 and I see, I see wind turbines that weren't there 20 years ago or five years ago. I see a recycling economy in, in other states that is starting to take off. I, I, I see students like yourself who are doing personal waste audits. This, I can tell you personally that the student of today is much more environmentally conscious than the student 10 years ago that I hired. And it was, it's all fun and games, right? There's a, a little bit deeper knowledge about what the passion is about in the student today than what it was. I mean, you know, did all kinds of fancy tricks 10 years ago to make, make the subject matter interesting because there wasn't a whole lot of passion about it. But students today are pretty passionate, got to say. I don't know if you feel that way, but uh, like, like when I was a student many, many years ago, you know, we thought we were just kicking ass because we had a 10 cent uh, can deposit. And we thought that we were the best. Well, to find out, we weren't that good, but we thought we were. And now we're just much more, much more, um, I think, you know, the information age, if that's what you want to call it, with, with social and, and the way news is brought into the house, makes the world a much more smaller piece, right? And so you're able to connect these dots much more easily. So, so how do I know where my waste goes? Well, there's a lot of ways to find that out now. And you found it out your own self. Um, there's a lot of a lot of information out there. I, 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 at sometimes, for me, I get a little bit jaded about about information because it gets spun so much. But anyway, um, I think everybody knows that um, climate change thing, right? There's issues. And even if even if you disagree with climate change, you, you can you can certainly look at what you do with the waste that you have and understand at, at the most basic level what I'm doing is either responsible or not. And and it's like like piling food on your plate, right? If you pile more food on a plate than you can eat, does that make you feel good? Probably not. So those truths have always been true. And it's just that I think that we have ways to act on them now that we didn't have before. Hence, when I started here at CMU, we had a 20% diversion rate. Now we got a 40% diversion rate. I didn't do it. You did it. Yes, Teresa, you did. 
<laughs> and students yeah, like you. And students like you. Because our composting program was a student-based initiative 10 years ago in a little tiny pile that hedgehogs got into. And uh, uh, and it grew and grew and grew. And so did the hedgehogs. And, um, and we ended up making 70 tons of compost ourselves. We weren't even hauling it anywhere then. We built screens and we'd turn the pile. I'd have students turn the pile and we'd measure the heat off the compost pile. And they would do amazing things and they would take this finished compost and they would use it in these community gardens uh, behind the parking lot over at Tennyson Stadium where the compost pile was. And eventually the student run um, project became so big that it developed a life of its own. And now it's part of what we do and saves the university $15,000 a year. There's a lot of little type of projects like that, that are student initiatives that were dreamed up by students and uh, helped by administration. And um, sometimes they have legs, sometimes they don't. But, you know, hey, look, we try, we try a little bit of everything and see what happens. That's what you do in a learning environment. Learn. Well, I think that was a good answer to my very confusing question. Um, so I like how you were able to kind of work work past that one um, there. But I suppose to go from there, um, you know, we're talking about collaborative efforts. We're talking about student engagement um, and how small things can kind of grow and expand on their own and have, as you put it, um, $15,000, you know, benefits to it um, yeah. that may, that weren't necessarily the original goal, but kind of right. came out of there. Um, so from there, I suppose, um, who do you think we need to get involved in these sort of initiatives and sustainability? What sort of partnerships should we get? Well, I, I just had a phone call today with Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe, uh, county, city, and um, uh, couple other privates and um, we're trying to do something together and and try to do some community um, organic recovery and it, it looks like it's something that we can do together so you know you have to think beyond the boundaries of your own house your own work your own com internal community, other communities that you're adjacent to. And remember, there, there, there's a whole world that is grappling with the same problem. And they're having success in varying degrees. Go find like-minded people and share your experiences with them. And when you do that, you learn from each other. It's the best form of learning. It's the most impactful type of learning. It brings us together as society, as, as de desperate, desperate societies, you know, they're sprinkled here and there, brings people from Europe together with people in China, people from China to the United States. And, you know, everybody's looking at, hey, look, you know, I, I, I would like to live in a clean world too, right? And so, you know, they do it a little differently than we do. And you have a common understanding about how things are done, shared experiences, learn from each other. It's the best. It's energizing. You're young. You should do that. I guess that leads me into my next question. Um, as far as what I should do, um, any advice here? Um, I guess, we've, you know, we've covered a lot of subjects, but from what we've been talking about, what sort of advice would you have for students on how they can get involved in um, sustainability or being, being smart, I guess? Follow your passion. That's all you gotta do. You know, if you are interested in something, pursue it. And it will find, you will find other things that you're interested in. And, and when you look back, 
30 years from now, you will go, geez, you know, I made a career out of things that interested me. And usually that's how it works. People generally, usually do not try to make a career out of things that they don't like. <laughs> usually. <laughs> so, so remember, remember that you like a clean planet. And you like not wasting things. And as you find other things you like, you will take those values with you into those arenas and make those values in those arenas. And you will have a cleaner planet and you will feel good about yourself. And you'll have a little bit of fun along the way. I mean, that's kind of kind of the goal here. Um, yeah, so I suppose now that- You're gonna do it, I, whether I tell you or not. You will do that thing, whether I tell you or not, because it is what people do. They pursue things they like yeah. and, and yeah. run away from things they don't. Hopefully that can be productive um, in the sense where like, you're not just running away from the things that you don't like, just because you don't want to solve. Keep an open thing. mind. Keep an open mind. Yeah. But I'm saying, what if someone wants to run away from their trash and not think about it? That's sad. Is that part of the human condition? Or is that? Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's oh, kind of where we're at answer? right now. Yeah. What? Are you for an answer? It could be a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> if you got an answer, well, I'll, hear I'll it. put it to you this way. I'll put it to you this way. You can't run away from your trash because you're producing it all the time. So you're, you're running away from a problem that you have to live with. Mm -hmm. So you might as well, I mean, if you have to live with a problem, you might as well make it as small as possible. I think that's, that's pretty solid advice there. <laughs> um, so I think that though, that's pretty much, I mean, do you have any final thoughts, anything you want to add to this so far? I'm really thankful for you students. You're the best part of my day. Usually I have to hang around with uh, old jaded people who are, who are kind of stuck in a rut, but I love hanging out with students. They're always the best part of your day. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad I can be, I'm included in that category. Yeah, um, you are. You are. Yeah, that's something that, um, you know, I mean, doing this kind of work so far, um, we get shot down a lot uh, and told no a lot. Um, and By old people like me. Yeah, I mean, you're you're not wrong there. Um, <laughs> I remember <laughs> when when um, I was speaking to someone from UCOM, they had like a question for me and they said, you know, what about your um, experiences at CMU uh, are making this possible for you? And I'm like, well, you know, that's a very, very leading question. They want me to say something positive about CMU. Um, <laughs> like, I can, I, but that aside, I think the, it's not so much necessarily being at CMU, it's literally just being um, a student that makes these things possible because you're not you're not really limited by um yeah i mean i think that there's a lot of power and a lot of um opportunity in being naive because there's not really anything to stop you um from asking certain questions um you're not jaded yet just being a student you're not i mean you can be um, it's not hard. Well, you have an excuse it. for blundering into problems. You say, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm here to learn. That's why I yeah. blundered into this. Yeah. I'm, so teach me. That's what I'm here to do. Learn. And you're not limited by what everyone else thinks is possible and not. Yeah, that's true. My other advice would be stay simple. Yeah. I was talking to a student yesterday they talking about their capstone project. And their capstone project was this big, right? So you get trying to do too much. You know, focus, 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 focus. Focus on something that, that you can completely understand. So anyway, it, try, try, to, try to 
try to understand what what you're concerned about or what you're and and being concerned is not you know a worry concerned is about what you do right you're concerned about the planet you're concerned about your own self you're concerned about your health you're concerned about what you eat the things concerning you understand that all right well i think that we're kind of we're kind of just in the final stages here but um something that this is how we've been wrapping up these podcasts. Um, thanks, special thanks to Mimi Gonzalez for coming up with this idea. Because thank um, you, Mimi. I was told no, not the podcast. The how the conclusion. The conclusion. Um, I wasn't sure how to end these things, right? And so we were talking, and it's just an epiphany. And I think that you might agree with this one. But um, what do you say? Every day is Earth Day. What are your thoughts on that? You think that's a a, a true a true statement there? Yeah, I do. Okay. I mean, well, we're that's... on the earth. Every day we are on the earth. It's not every day is Mars day. No. I don't think there's a single day that's Mars day, to be quite yeah, honest. There's, there's, no, there's no moon day. Thank God it's moon day. Thank God it's earth day. I mean, you know? I don't know. There's like festivals, Lun- the lunar moon, festival. The lunar festival. True. Yeah. There's... True. um. You know, there's the days when the moon is being weird, you know, the red moon, blood moon, blue moon. What, what I'm what I'm what I'm supposing to you mm-hmm. is enjoy the moment. Enjoy where you're at. Make the most of this moment. Make the most of where you're at. Mm-hmm. Because you will always be at some place until you're not so you might as well enjoy the moment and this moment is on this planet so always every day is earth day always is earth day and that's kind of how we're wrapping these up so (laughs) thank you so much Teresa. i appreciate the time yes i appreciate the moments that we have shared Thank you for coming in and um, just speaking about this. I know you were worried about your qualifications, but you did a great. 